The text this morning is from the second epistle of John, verses 5 through 7. These are the words of God. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Father and God, your word is before us. Open it, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Open and apply it to our hearts, we ask again, in the name of Jesus. Help us to see how you would have us live, and we ask for this boldly, in the name of Jesus, and amen. amen. So as we all know, Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Christ. Christmas is a celebration of the incarnation of the Son of God. Not only was this incarnation a great expression of love, if we are thinking scripturally, we're going to come to see it as the very definition of love. And notice that this definition, in order to be a true definition, must be an incarnate definition. It must be a definition in 3D. God defines love in this way, and he does something. God so loved the world, it says in John 3.16, that he gave. What did he give? Well, God ultimately has nothing to give but himself. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this is love. This is what love means. This is the definition of love. You can get a secondary or tertiary definition of love by looking it up in the dictionary or even looking it up in a theological di dictionary. But if you want the actual definition of love, you have to have the actual Christ. You have to have the actual Jesus. You have to have actual incarnation. So incarnational love is the way in which we must walk. According to our text, God behaved in a certain way, God had a certain disposition, and he acted in a particular way, and we are summoned to do the same thing. We are summoned to imitate it. As Paul says in Ephesians, as dearly loved children, be imitators of God. God is like this. God loves and he acts. God loves and he gives. God loves and he gives himself. And John exhorts the lady that he's writing to, uh, the beloved lady, he's saying, this is how we ought to be. Incarnational love is the way in which we must walk. John beseeches this unknown woman to whom he writes in this way. He pleads with her, not as though there were some new commandment. Rather, he pleads with her that we all continue to love one another. He says, this is not a new commandment. It's not, it's not as though God suddenly said, oh, my goodness, let's try something. Let's try the way of love. It wasn't that way. God didn't change over to the way of love. Between Malachi and Matthew, God is eternally, everlastingly love itself. God is love, the Bible tells us. The Bible doesn't teach us that God has love. The Bible teaches us that God is love. So it's not a new commandment at all. It's not a new idea. This is the commandment we've had from the beginning. So John is pleading with her that, to, that, that we might all continue to love one another. This is the same commandment that we've had from the very beginning, verse 5. This is the commandment. This is the law of Christ. This is what love foundationally is, walking in the commandment. If you walk in the commandment, that means you're doing. That means you're practicing. That means you are incarnational. You are living in an incarnational way. So this is what love foundationally is, walking in the commandment. And what is the commandment? That we walk in love, verse 6. So in verse 6, we're told that we're to walk in love. This is the commandment. It's not a new one, not a new idea, not a new thing. Walk in love. Do love. Practice love. Don't approve of love from a distance. Don't read about love in a book and say, yes, that accords with my way of thought. Do it. Act on it. Go, go do something for someone. Go love someone. Go, do, go and act the way God went and acted. Now, this is to be done with a basic wariness about deceivers. There are many deceivers out and about, John says. Many deceivers have entered the world. How are they to be identified? They are the ones who refuse to confess something. They refuse to confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That's a deceiver. That one is a liar. That one is a false teacher. That one is an antichrist. Verse 7. And while, while we're here, let me just say something as an aside. Um, 
in, in the popular imagination, the beast of Revelation, the great uh, persecutor of the church, the beast of Revelation is readily and quickly and automatically conflated with the Antichrist of Second John here, and the, the Antichrist is mentioned in First John. But an Antichrist, if, if we translated the, the first century uh, terminology into modern terminology, um, the, the beast would be someone like a Stalin or a Pol Pot or a Hitler, a, pers- a, uh, a political ruler who persecutes the church. That's the beast of Revelation, a political ruler who persecutes the church. The Antichrist is not the beast. There's nothing in the Bible anywhere that, tells, that would uh, um, lead us to, to identify the Antichrist with the beast. The beast is a persecutor of the church. He uses the power of the sword. He persecutes the church that way. The Antichrist is a false teacher within the church. So a modern beast would be a a, a Stalin or a Hitler. A modern antichrist would be a liberal Methodist bishop, all right? Someone who denied the incarnation. Someone, we just said the Apostles' Creed a little bit ago, and every phrase he would say, nope, 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 not that way, no, 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 no. Uh, God, we, we confess that God sent his son, and the son of God, the eternal word of God, took on human flesh. The Antichrist, the deceiver, the liar, denies that. So consequently, the incarnation is a big deal. The incarnation is how we identify the Antichrist. The incarnation is how we identify Antichrist teaching. If someone denies the incarnation, if someone says that Christmas is not about God come in the flesh, Jesus Christ is not God in flesh, then that person is a deceiver, a liar, and an Antichrist. So, what are we to do with all this? Let's, let's begin with a brief grammar lesson. Some of you have heard th- some of this from me before, but it, it's very important. It's very important to go over these things. As Paul says in Philippians, to repeat the same things over again is not a problem for me, and it's helpful for you. So let's go with this, this brief grammar lesson. An indicative statement is a statement of fact. An indicative statement is a statement of fact. The door is open. That's an indicative statement. It, it, you can assign true or false to it. It's simply a fact. We do not know who opened it, only that somebody did. The door is open. When an indicative statement is made, the only thing that you can do with it is believe it or not. That's the only response that's called for. You, you can say, if someone says the door is open, you can either say, yes, it is, or no, it isn't. You can either say, I believe that, or no, I don't believe that. It started to rain. I believe you, I don't believe you. The sun has risen. I believe that or I don't believe that. That's that's the only thing you can do with an indicative statement. The one thing you cannot do is obey it. You can't obey an indicative. You cannot, in response to the door is open, spring up and say that you will go open it right away. At least not without without a great category excuse me, great category confusion. You will only confuse yourself and you will do nothing to the door. Now, this is, it's very easy when someone gets into preacher mode to slip, uh, to do a little pee uh, pee and shell thing and and nobody notices. You can, you can, you can read a text and the text is a grand indicative. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I have been crucified with Christ. That's an indicative statement. And then the preacher does a little sleight of hand and turns it into an imperative. Why aren't you crucified? You better get crucified. What's taking you so long? And beat you up as though there was a hidden imperative in the indicative statement. But an indicative statement, the only thing you can do with it is believe it or not. That's the only thing you, this is why the only thing you can do with gospel is believe it or not. Christ died on the cross. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven. He poured out the Holy Spirit. There it is. Indicative, 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 indicative. Now, are you going to believe it or not? Do you accept that? Is that true or not? Now, if you believe it, certain things will follow as we're going, as we see this is a pattern in Scripture, it is not to say that there's no relationship between indicatives and imperatives. If someone were to tell you the door is open and then command you to acknowledge that the door was open, this would be a command. It would be an imperative that presupposes knowledge of the facts, knowledge of the indicative. 
Now, according to our text, Jesus Christ is God, come in the flesh, is a staggering indicative. It is a staggering fact, but it's still a fact. It's still an indicative statement for all that. Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. Believe that he has come in the flesh is the imperative. Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and that is true whether or not any of us ever come to believe it. That is, that's an objective fact. If, if someone says the door is open and you say, I don't believe it, but if the door is open, your disbelief doesn't have anything to do with whether the door is open or shut. The, the, the truth of that statement is independent of your emotional response to it, or it's independent of your intellectual response to it. So there's, there's a, a, an important two-step process in the proclamation of the gospel. The proclamation of the gospel, this is what God has told us to go out and tell every creature, everything that moves, we're supposed to do two things. We're supposed to declare the indicative. We're supposed to declare what God has done. We're supposed to declare it, and it was done 2,000 years before you were born. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem before you were born anywhere. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life before you were named. Jesus Christ was crucified. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And all of that was independent of your opinions. All of it was independent of your opinion. And it's either true or it's not true. It's either true or it's false. Apostles and ministers, evangelists, church planters, not to mention all Christians, are all commissioned to go out into the world with a simple two-part message. Number one, declare the grand indicative. Number two, command all men everywhere to believe and confess the truth of what was just declared. So if we go straight to the command, this is what happens in so much evangelism today. We go straight to the command. Receive Jesus into your heart. Well, who's he? <laughs> what, on what basis? How, how can I receive? Uh, is there any content to this? So we're commanding people to have a certain emotional response to Jesus. Ask Jesus to come into your heart or ask Jesus to take over your life. And nothing wrong with uh, asking Jesus in your heart. Not, nothing wrong with surrendering your life to him. But there is something wrong with doing that without any content information. The content is this. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the eternal word of God who took on human form, who took on the, the body of a human. He became truly human, and he lived a perfect human life, and he did so so that humanity would have something to point to when God looks, looks down at us and says, has anybody down there ever obeyed my law? Has any, have any of you ever done right? And we point to Jesus. We can't point to Adam. We can't point to ourselves. We can't point to ourselves on a good day or a good week. We, can't, we have nothing to point to. If God says, has anyone done right? Has, is anyone righteous? Is anyone upright? Has anyone ever resisted all temptation? Has anyone ever lived a, a life of perfect humility? Anyone? All of us should just say, there's, there's Jesus. There's Jesus. And Jesus is not just a random one-off guy. Jesus came as the second Adam. He came to be the head of a new human race. He came so that in the middle of this old polluted river, this old human race, this polluted river that all of us dwell in, a fresh water spring is planted in the middle of it. And by faith, we can join ourselves to that family, that new river. That new river of fresh water is flowing downstream through the polluted river, and by the time it gets to the sea, it's going to be a pure, glorious river. Because God is in the process of fashioning a new humanity out of the old humanity, using the old humanity as the raw material. But in order to do that, he needed a starter human, a perfect human, a perfect man who did it right. And so we point to him by faith. If we point to him by faith, then the Bible teaches that we are joined, we are united with him, and we become partakers of all his benefit, all of his righteousness. Everything that he is becomes ours. Now, this is what we declare. Jesus Christ came and did that, and do you believe it? Right? You're commanded to believe it. God commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. So this is, um, this is the breakdown. God, Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. That's the grand indicative. Believe that he is God come in the flesh. That is the imperative. 
So declare the grand indicative and summon all men to repent and believe. Repent and bow the knee. Repent and submit. Now, there's another important aspect of this. From the day that, the, that sin first entered the world, love has always been understood in relationship to its contrary, in relationship to its opposite. When God cursed the serpent, he established the antithesis between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. In Genesis 3.15. God says, and this is why this world always has turmoil. There's always turmoil between those who are God's people and those who are not God's people. There's always, there's always an antithesis between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Jesus was not reaching into a, a handy bag of insults when he called the Pharisees a brood of vipers. He was saying that they were the seed of the serpent. They were, they were on the other side of this great divide. God established two kinds of being human. God established the, a, a, an innocent kind of being human in Adam before the fall. Adam and Eve, in their rebellion, plunged the human race into, um, into sin, into corruption. Eve led Adam astray, and Adam was the one who caused the race to fall. And so Adam plunged us all into this decayed, corrupted, messed up state. We were depraved, undone, totally helpless. We could not save ourselves. And in in the midst of that human wreckage, God determined that he was going to rebuild what he had intended at the first. He was going to rebuild a glorious humanity, which was his intent all along. And he was going to use the flawed, broken, corrupted materials that we provided with him, provided to him. And so Jesus was born, born of a woman, born under the law, born into this corrupt, dark, um, sin-messed-up world. And, and God had had people all through the Old Testament looking forward to the fulfillment of this promise. And these people were righteous by, by God's grace through faith. And the people who wanted to, to stay with the old way of being, with, with the old Adamic way of being corrupt, were hostile to those who were God's people. Jesus was the first person who did absolutely everything right. Jesus was the first person who never stumbled. He never fell. He never sinned. He never railed against God. Even on the cross, even at the moment of his dereliction, when God abandoned him, when God turned his face away from him and poured out his wrath on all of your sin and my sin, was imputed to Jesus, and God poured out his wrath on Jesus at that moment. Even in that moment, As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what what it says there is even in the moment of dereliction, when God turned his face away, when God poured out all his wrath on all the wickedness of all that all the elect have ever done, he placed it on Jesus and poured it out on Jesus. And when Jesus cried out in despair, it was still a holy, holy despair. It was a blameless despair. It was a sinless despair. He cries out, my God, my God. It's still my God, my God. Secondly, he's quoting scripture. He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. He's probably, uh, some scholars think that he began quoting Psalm 22, 1, and then somewhere in the 30s, in Psalm 30, there's a passage that says, into your hands I commend my spirit. Some people believe, I I think uh, reasonably enough, that Jesus began quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, and quoted all the way through Um, uh, into your hands I commend my spirit. So he's quoting scripture. It's still my God. It's still my God. It's still quoting scripture. And he's trusting himself to God. Jesus knew all of this beforehand. Jesus knew what was coming. And this is why he prayed the way he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew what was coming. It was all laid out in the Old Testament scripture. The suffering servant had to suffer. The suffering servant had to suffer. And so, as long as God had a people that he is calling, that he's been calling to himself uh, out of this fallen world, the antithesis has to be understood by all who would be faithful to him. In the incarnation, God's son entered the world. Now, it's striking that the same expression here in our passage is used of the deceivers. They, too, have entered the world, many of them. Many deceivers come, and they come not confessing. Notice this, verse 7, 
for many deceivers are entered into the world. Deceivers have entered into the world. What did the Son of God do? He entered into the world. And deceivers have done the same thing. These, he's a, he is the Christ. They are the Antichrist. They are the mimic. They are, the, they are uh, copying. Uh, Jesus comes and says, teaches certain things. He gives himself. He is God in the flesh. And then the Antichrist, the knockoff Christs, the counterfeit, the counterfeit Christ, the counterfeit gospelers come into the world. They come into the world too. And they say, they refuse to confess that Jesus is God in the flesh. They too have entered the world. Many of them have entered the world. And they come into the world not confessing, not confessing the truth. This means that there is no confession of the truth, no love of the truth, where there is not a rejection of the lie, a rejection of those who will not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Proverbs 8, 13 says this, The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Remember, God established the antithesis. This means there is no way, there's no way to be a faithful Christian and come down into the, the world as it is. Remember, the world as it is is filled with genocide, rape, hatred, wars, oppression, poverty, um, slavery to sin. It, it, this, the, this world is a, um, a horrible, messed up place. And if you come into this world with a simple message of love, peace, pussy willows, and kittens, right? I just want to pause. I just want to accentuate the positive. I just want to come down and point to the nice things. Well, if you come down and point to sweet things and point to nice things, and that's all you do, then you're an apostle of not paying attention. You're an apostle of you're an, you. You are bringing a message that doesn't does not take into account the way things actually are. Remember, in the, in the nativity, we don't just have the shepherds, and we don't just have the angels in the sky, and we don't just have the wise men. We have Herod's men killing babies. Right? We, ha we have Herod's men doing awful things. We have a sin-darkened world. We have a blood-soaked planet. We have a blood-soaked blood generation. We have a blood-soaked nation. 50 million unborn children. 50 million unborn children slaughtered legally in the United States. And remember, the first, we, some people oftentimes make uh, a, a great um, deal, in the, as they ought, about the first witnesses at the empty tomb being the women. The women were the first ones to come to the empty tomb. I, I think that that's a glorious reality, and we ought to emphasize it. But the first human witness to the Lord, Lord Jesus' presence, the first human witness testifying directly as the Spirit moved him was John the Baptist in his mother's womb. An unborn child testified. Now, the, the, shepherds, came, you know, the, the, the shepherds came later, when the, but the angels told them. The Spirit moved John the Baptist directly when he was in utero to leap for joy at, at, at the presence of his Lord. We are in a bad way. We are in rebellion. We want, to, we want to craft our own way of doing things right. We want our own methods of righteousness. And we, that means we are deceivers. We are antichrist. We are in rebellion against heaven. And if in this world Christians want to have... Um, Spurgeon once said that there are some ministers who handle the text, uh, handle the, text the way a donkey chews a thistle very carefully. Just, you just tiptoe all around. You never, want to, you never want to get into any kind of trouble. But prophets come roaring out of the wilderness to come into, in, come into the royal king's palace and, and say things like John the Baptist later said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to be doing what you're doing. It is not lawful for you to be doing what you're doing. There's a God in heaven, and he is seeing all of this. Now, that means that you, we, you, I, everyone has to be prepared for when, if, if there's any kind of faithfulness at all, if there's any kind of light shining in this dark world at all, we have to be prepared for the counterattack. We have to be prepared for the antithesis to behave like an antithesis. We have to be prepared for the collision. You cannot, ha you cannot love the wheat without hating the tares. You cannot love the patient without hating the cancer. You cannot love the sheep without hating the wolves. You cannot love the truth 
without hating the lie. Notice that um, John is talking about the essence of love. This is love that God gave himself. This is love. And what is the antichrist? What is the deceiver? A denial that God is, in effect, a denial that God is love. So this is love God gives. The Antichrist is the one who says God is not a giver. God is a skin flint. God does not overflow. Do you really think, the serpent said in the garden, do you really think that God has your best interest in mind? Notice, notice how this can be cast. Adam and Eve were created a perfect couple, perfect, perfect marriage, perfect garden, perfect world, perfect fellowship with God. Uh, they had the entire globe. They had the, whole thing to, they had the whole thing to subdue and exercise dominion. God gave them a planet as a present. He gave them a world as a present. And the serpent comes up to them and says, in effect, do you think he did that for you? What's in it for him? What's in it for him? Well, I, you know, anyone who could speak a world into existence, anyone who could speak the galaxies into existence is manifestly not doing it because he's in need of anything. He's not, God did not create because he was lonely. He did not create because he was deficient in any regard. He, he created in order to give. And as soon as, as, soon as someone gives, how easy, is, how easy it, is it to say, well, why didn't he give me more? Someone, someone gives you a present for Christmas. Why didn't you give me two of them? You know, uh, uh, why, uh, that's the way the sinful heart works. Um, why, you gave me a tie. Why didn't I get two ties? You gave me, gave me a pair of socks. Why didn't you get five pairs of socks? And, and once that attitude is in, 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 once that attitude has taken root, it doesn't matter if the person says, okay, I'll give you whatever you ask because it just keeps ratcheting up. Because... We are all born with a case, and this um, Christmas is tomorrow, kids. Make, make sure that you don't ro roar through tomorrow morning with a bad case of the gimme, gimme, gimmies. Right? Because that's, and, and grown-ups oftentimes have the gimmies also. They just have been trained not to show it. <laughs> because they're, they're, they're politer than you're being, but they're not more righteous than you're being. If we, if if we have the gimme, gimme, gimmies, or I'm disappointed, someone gave me that, and it's not enough. Someone gave me that, and that's not enough. Someone gave me the other thing, and that's not enough. We're going right back to Adam and Eve. God gave them everything, and the serpent said, hey, here's how you could, here's how you could squeeze a little bit more out of it. Let me introduce, a, instead of just receiving the gift, why don't you receive the gift with impatience? Why don't you grab for a little bit more? Well, you can't love the truth without hating a lie. You, can't, you cannot love the truth without finding yourself in collision, in, in, uh, in some sort of adversarial, adversarial relationship with the lie. And so, see how all these things are bound together. Those who do not obey the commandment are those who do not walk in love. Those who do not walk in love are those who will not confess the reality concerning Jesus. Before walking in love, walk around it first. Take it in. What is the nature of love? Walk around it first. What I mean is this. Look at what it means to walk in love. It means to confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's what it means. Uh, doesn't it mean doing a nice thing? No, if, if you just do a nice thing, if you just do a little Boy Scout gesture to someone and it's not related to the fact that God himself took on human flesh, you're going to run out of gas. All right? You're going to do a nice thing, and then you might do a nice thing tomorrow. But if you don't have a reason for being nice, let's face it, that's a lot of work. Right? If you don't have a reason, if, it's, if you don't have a, a transcendental grounding for why we're supposed to be this way, and what is a better grounding than that the ultimate reality is this way, God himself is this way. God himself took on flesh. If you walk around love and you say, in, instead of looking straight to your particular duties, how, you, how could you be nice to your spouse? How could you be kinder to your children? How, how could you be a little more gracious to your neighbor? Instead of going straight to those uh, imperatives, right? Be nice, do good, be pleasant, be sweet. Instead of going straight to the imperatives, you need to walk around the indicative and consider it, ponder it, meditate on it. God, God himself visited our world so that 
he would have a body that we could crucify. That's why he did it. God himself cannot be tempted. God is immortal. God cannot, God cannot be killed. Our, our spears can't reach him. Our arrows can't reach him. Our bullets can't reach him. Our rockets can't reach him. God is immortal. God is in, invulnerable. God cannot be touched. And so he became a man. That's what Bethlehem is all about. He became a man. He took on a human body so that we could get at him. That's why he did it. So that he, he, he took on mortality so that we could kill him. He was lying in a manger so that he would have a body that would grow up into the body of a man that we would be capable of murdering. That's what, that's what this is all about. And he, why, did he do, why did he do that? So that God, he would be a, a true human being who could represent us so that we could have a representative who really was one of us, who really did go to the head of this new humanity and say, God... Whatever we deserve, have the blow fall on our federal covenant representative. Have the blow fall on Jesus. And what falls on Jesus falls on me. When, I, when Adam reached for the fruit in the garden, I reached for the fruit in the garden. When Adam sinned, I sinned. When Adam sinned, you sinned. And when this is the glorious part, though. When Jesus didn't sin, you didn't sin. When Jesus stood upright, you stood upright. When Jesus said no to the devil, you said no to the devil. When Jesus went to the cross to pay for sin, it was you in him paying for sin. This goes back to the indicative statement that Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I have been crucified with Christ. Or in, or in, Romans, in Romans chapter 6, this is what uh, the baptisms that we just did this morning, this is what baptism means. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized in Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? When Jesus died, you died. When Jesus stood, when Jesus was, was victorious, you were victorious. When Jesus was sinless, you were sinless. When Jesus had, had God, God himself spoke from heaven, well done, this is, my, this, is my, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Those words are rightly yours. God says to you, well done. God says to you, enter into joy. And this is all because Jesus took on a body that was capable of being killed. So, before walking in love, walk around it. When we confess that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, God making himself woundable, God making himself killable, God making himself mortal, we are looking at what love means. We are looking at the exposure of self, the giving away of self, such that, so that others may be benefited, so that others may be blessed. So love means confessing that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This confession of the stupendous indicative cannot be made faithfully without finding yourself immediately in the midst of loving your brothers and sisters. If you confess scripturally, if you confess biblically, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. If you look at that, that, uh, the words of that Christmas carol of Jesus lying in the manger, and you look at those words and you know Jesus did that so that, I, so that he could be killed on my behalf. Jesus did that so that he could sacrifice himself for me, for my family, for my people. Jesus did that for us. When you look at that, you will, and you look at it in faith, remember this is an indicative, the only thing you can do is believe it or not, the only thing you can do is accept it or not. If you accept it, if you believe it, if you see it for what it is, and you accept it for what it is, you find yourself, without any higher math at all, loving other people. You find yourself loving your brothers and sisters. You find yourself walking in love. And if you have a really hard time walking in love, if, you, if the other person, if you've got one nerve left and the other person's on it, and, and, and you have... They come into the room, they walk into the room, and you have to start praying for grace, and you, and you don't know why you do that because you never get any. They, they, always, they are always constantly, forever, irritating you. If that's the way it is between you and a brother or sister in Christ, if that's the way it is between you and a family member, if that's the way it is between you and your child or between you and your spouse, if that's the way it is, you need to take a cold, hard, calculated, theological look at the baby in the manger because he is there for one reason 
And that reason is so that he could grow up and die on the cross for you and that attitude of yours. That's what he's doing. That's what he's there for. That's what it's all about. That's the message. Christmas is gospel, gospel, gospel. So, what does walking in love mean for Jesus Christ? For him, walking in love meant being God come in the flesh. For us, walking in love means confessing that this is who he is. The love of God is the mirrored side of the law of God. James tells us that the law of God is like a plate glass window and not like a series of French panes. A lot of people think that the commandments are like independent panes of glass and your job was to get through the world, get through your life without breaking out most of the windows, right? There's 10 commandments. I, I'm still, I've only broken four of them and if I, if I can hang on and not break six, then I'm, I'm all right. Well, it's not that way. If you break the law anywhere, you've broken the whole thing. James 2.10. The Bible tells us that the law of God is a plate glass window. It's not a series of discrete panes. It's a plate glass window, and it doesn't much, doesn't much matter where you put the hole. If you put the hole in the middle or the hole in the, in the lower right or the hole in the upper left, or you put a bunch of holes, it doesn't matter. It's a plate glass, glass window. All of us are sinners. All of us have broken the law of God. But the glory of the new covenant is this. God is full of reversals. The glory of the new covenant is this. If you keep the gospel at any point, you have kept all of it. If you understand the baby in the manger, you understand the cross and the burial and the, and the resurrection and the ascension. If you understand the resurrection, you understand the baby in the manger and the crucifixion. The gospel is, in its very nature, a, a message that is whole and entire. The whole thing comes to you. The, the perfect sinless life, the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the pouring of the Holy Spirit. All of it. If you, get, if you get one part of it, you've gotten all of it. No one is saved by a partial Jesus. And no one ever had a partial Christ. No one ever possessed a partial Christ. Christ is not received on the installment plan. You don't take, you don't take it in bits and pieces. If you have Jesus at all, you have all of him. If you have Jesus at all, you have all of him. And if you confess him, you love him. If you love him, you are walking in him. If you have the commandment at all, you've had it from the beginning. Salvation is a grand mystery. But one thing we can say about all of it is this. It is never parceled out in tiny bits. It is not distributed with a teaspoon. If you have Jesus at all, you have all of Jesus. If you are a Christian at all, he owns all of you. He possesses you. The most miserable Christian who ever lived, provided you really is a Christian, I'm not talking about those who say, yeah, uh huh. I'm not talking about those who just have catechism answers in their head. I'm talking about if someone is, is really a Christian, it, it, they're, they're genuinely a Christian, they're born again, it doesn't matter if their experience is that of a C-minus Christian. Johnny Cash said that one time. He said, I'm a C-minus Christian. He says, but I am one, right? I'm a C-minus Christian, but I am one. If you are a Christian at all, if you are a Christian at all, you have no less of Jesus Christ than the saintliest believer who ever lived. If you are justified by the gospel at all, your justification is perfect. Your justification is does not pale in comparison to the justification of great saints in history. You look at the justification of the Apostle Paul, the justification of Peter, the justification of those who knew Jesus, the justification of the early martyrs, the justification that was bestowed on the great reformers of the church. You have the same righteousness. It's all the same. You don't get, you, nobody gets the grade B, nobody gets the dregs, nobody gets the, the, the uh, byproduct. If you have Jesus at all, you have the perfect Jesus. If you have Jesus at all, you have everything you need. That's why Peter says we have all that we need for life and godliness. Everything that we need for life and godliness has been given to us. So the most miserable Christian who ever lived, provided he really is a Christian, has no less of Jesus than the saintliest Christian ever. And this is because Christ was born in a stable, and he was born to be given to us. All of him was given for us. And so it is that we are saved to the uttermost. 
We are saved to the uttermost. God is taking us to places that we cannot even begin to imagine. And in order to take us to that high place, he stooped to the very lowest place. Not only was he born into poverty, not only was he laid in a feed box, not only did he take on a human body, but he did all this so that he could be rejected, scorned, despised, spat on. He, he became a little boy baby so he could grow up and to be a man, he, so that he could grow a beard, so he could have that beard pulled out for you. That's, that's what happened. Wherefore, it says in Hebrews 7.25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Mark that phrase. He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ died for you, and notice he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That means Jesus Christ is praying for you. Jesus Christ is praying for you. We, we encourage one another often by saying, I'll pray for you, we'll pray for one another. We take encouragement from the fact that others pray for us. But you need to take encouragement in this. Jesus not only died for you, he prays for you. He's praying for you right now. Jesus ever lives to make intercession. Why? Because you're being saved to the uttermost and you're not there yet. Right? You're being saved to the uttermost and there's work ahead. You're being saved to the uttermost and Jesus is interceding with the Father. And I submit this one thing to you. After all Jesus went through, after everything Jesus went through, do you think Jesus is going to ask for anything on your behalf and be denied? I don't think so. Our Father and God, you have shown astonishing amounts of mercy to us, and so we ask you to continue that mercy by sending the Holy Spirit to bring us to the point where we are extending astonishing amounts of mercy ourselves. We offer our prayers to you now in the words that Jesus instructed us to pray, saying, We are created and shaped in the image of God, and we are the crowning glory of matter. Our first father, Adam, was fashioned out of the earth, and when we die, we return to that earth. For a time, matter is organized in such a way as to love, think, sing praises to God, congregate in families, and everything else that we do. But this returning to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, to dust is a problem. Death is an enemy. This happens because our, rebe our race rebelled against God, and the warning was fulfilled. The day you eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, you shall surely die. But God is a gracious God, and right after our fall into death, he promised us that a descendant of the woman would come and that he would crush the head of the serpent. This he has done, and we are delivered. But although we are delivered and saved, we are still suffering some of the consequences of our first rebellion. It is hard to be the glory of matter when you only rise above it for a time and then you return to it. God has purposed to raise, raise us to life everlastingly, and we will forever. Flesh and bone dwell with, it, dwell with him. But he has seen fit to prepare us for this over time. He does not do it all at once. So throughout the course of our lives, he gives us emblems for our salvation and sanctification. To receive, to read, to hear, to eat, and to drink. He uses these instruments to prepare us for the glory that is coming. The point is to respond in faith to the word of God. Are you baptized? Respond in faith. Do you hear the word preached? Respond in faith. Is the bread in your hand? Take and eat it in evangelical faith. Is the wine in your cup? Drink it in faith, all of it. Why should you do this? The reason is that it is God's good pleasure that you will live forever. But as we prepare to dwell with him, we realize that we must be acclimated, and to do that, we must do as we are told, in faith. God is shaping us, and so let us submit to him. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. The charge, the exhortation is somewhat obvious. Have a Merry Christmas. But... But remember, you can't have one. Without Christ, there is no such thing as Christmas. And without gospel, without the entire message of gospel, there's no such thing as a Merry Christmas. So have a Merry Christmas. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.